Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of ElevateNonprofit.com, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swaim. Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator. Today, we're going to do one of my favorite things, which is to talk to another event planner. <laughs> um, I learned so much when we get the opportunity to collaborate with other event planners. And t- today on the show, we have Tanya Mickelson. Yes. And Tanya and I have had the opportunity to work on a lot of events together. We've all had a chance to work on a lot it's of true. events together. And have sort of this shared understanding that an event is this really sort of unique opportunity to move a mission forward, yep. to create an experience where guests leave there talking about the mission. So today we're going to dive into the guest experience at a fundraising yep. event. But before we begin, let's introduce everyone to Tanya Kristen. Let's. Tanya is a fundraising event producer and has produced big events and small events across the Midwest and Pacific Northwest. Her work in the nonprofit sector has generated events that bring mission to life for donors. I love <laughs> From picnics in an orchard for a land trust to gala and red carpets, Tanya is an expert in creating impact when gathering people. I'd love to start with sort of the big question first. Um, and I do this knowing that just a few weeks ago, we had Robert Goman on the podcast talking about the guest experience from the guest point of view. And I think I love it, just as you were saying, Sam, when we as planners get to talk about the guest experience because sometimes planning is not about the guest experience at all. Right. (laughs) So when the guest experience informs planning, that's when we're money. So how do you define a great guest experience? Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. This is one of my favorite topics. So I look forward to kind of nerding out with you two um, (laughs) about this. But uh, I think a great guest experience offers just that, like an experience. not a passive participation uh, on the sidelines of a gathering. Mm. I think the best events pull people in from start to finish in memorable, immersive moments that activate senses. What are they seeing, hearing, touching, tasting? Um, every time I plan an event, my goal is exactly what you said, Sam. <laughs> I want them leaving saying, oh my God, that was so much fun. I can't wait for next year. Um, so centering yourself in the guest shoes and incorporating that perspective through the entire planning process, I think, is a great way to incorporate that and really achieve that experience that you're going for, not just a room full of people. Anyone can do that. But <laughs> you want them leaving with a solid, solid, like, memorable, emotional experience that, you know, that's what matters when they think back to an event. You used all my favorite words, immersive, memorable, experiential. So how do you do that? How do you plan for that? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, finding footing on where to start on a practical level can be hard when you're trying to, you know, take the guest perspective into consideration with also keeping in mind you're trying to raise money. There's financial goals um, attached to fundraising events inherently. But I think that there's two kind of practical pieces that you can start with. Um, And that would be, number one, your venue. Uh, Mm -hmm. Especially if you're new or planning a new event or you're a new planner, choosing a venue that just inherently provides the natural space that creates the flow that you're going for is key. That makes your job so much easier. Um, Selecting a venue that creates that footprint and that path that you can kind of um, lead guests throughout the experience, I think is a big part of that. Yeah. And then number two, catering. I think it's critical to find a catering partner that can not only deliver from a quality perspective, but a timing perspective. Um, In my experience, these two pieces, venue and catering, are most directly tied to guest satisfaction in an event. If you can hit those two notes um, in a way that resonates with guests and creates a pleasant experience, I think you already have done half the work um, in creating a positive guest experience. Yeah. One of the sort of key elements of venue that I always find is important to consider is enough space. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) We look at like their advertising, right? The venues Mm -hmm. marketing and they say, we can accommodate up to 600 people. But if I were to then fill my event with 600 people, no one is breathing, moving, turning, you know, Mm -hmm. no, don't raise your hand too fast. Mm -hmm. You might smack someone in the face. Like the 
sort of maximum that can fit in the space doesn't always incorporate or include things like the footprint for your bar, the ability for people to socialize and socialize Absolutely. gathering space. That I think picking a venue with all of that in mind is a critical sort of key element to the guest experience. I, I totally agree. I mean, there's nothing that's going to tamper a personal experience of a guest more so than <laughs> lack of space. Yeah. It's too hot. I can't find the bar or food and I'm starving. If you can create easy flow and access to all of the great pieces that you've planned in your event, you know, you might have a silent auction. It won't matter if guests don't even know it's there because it's so packed with people or right. a photo booth. If they can't make their way to it, it doesn't matter. So uh, those, I think, can really help alleviate some of the the pinch points that we see events fall into. And I think a lot of people, when they're looking at venues, are, my experience with people in this space is we just need a venue. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That venue's cheaper. Uh-huh. There, yeah. the, the, the lack of engagement for the venue as your place of opportunity. Right. Your, yep. your, it, you can't be creative in your format if your venue's not going to allow it. Yeah, exactly. You can't invite those extra people if the venue's not going to allow it. You can't bring 100%. in that caterer if the venue's not going to allow yeah. it. And so I think a lot of people aren't, they're just looking at it as space and real estate yeah. instead of it being an environment. Mm. And and when 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 that comes to life in that way, um you're you're playing on a different level with your event and giving your event a different opportunity. I think sometimes too we're talking about guest experience, which is kind of a little bit more touchy feely, right? Right. <laughs> and people go, I don't care. I I this is a fundraiser. Right. Yeah. Right. And yet our argument always is those two are so inextricably linked yes. that you can't fundraise without it. So, Tanya, talk talk to us from your vantage point about how guest experience impacts fundraising. Absolutely. I mean, I think it comes down to pretty basic human economics, really. <laughs> when people are genuinely having fun and enjoying themselves, connecting with one another, they feel great. Uh if you add some good food and maybe a glass of wine or a trendy like mocktail, I think you're already setting a tone for your guests of creating this enjoyable, fun environment where if they're happy, they're going to be more inclined to give generously. Yeah. Yep. Um, I also feel like this brings up another really important aspect that can get lost in the shuffle, specifically with fundraising events. Even as fundraising event planners, uh, we are in the event business. We are, hospitality is key. Yeah. And I think it can get lost. Um, and so when you center hospitality, I feel like you are really caretaking um, and ensuring that every interaction with the guest is positive. Um, from the second they walk in the venue and they're greeted by a friendly volunteer directing them exactly where to go next. Um, for your volunteers at registration that are checking them in, giving them the bid cards, kind of giving them the next set of instructions or they're selling raffle tickets, whatever that may be, Every at every turn, if those interactions are fun and positive um, and warm and welcoming, I feel like it gives guests that kind of warm and fuzzy feeling that we're all looking for with yeah. really engaging in anything. Um, and I think that also dovetails really uh, directly into the three kind of components that we talk about a lot in the context of giving in a special appeal. But if you create moments along the way for your guests to be seen, to make a difference mm -hmm. and to feel like they're a part of something. Yeah. If you can do that from start to finish through your event, you're just enhancing the likelihood that they're going to open up those pocketbooks when it's time, um, when they're invited to do so. So I think that's, you know, key in fundraising is absolutely tied to guest experience. Yeah. When we have positive guest experience, the giving reflects that. Yeah, you're tell you're telling me you thought about me. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. You you center you centered that I'm there. Yeah. This is what makes you so good at what you do. Yeah. It's the mm -hmm. like whole picture in that we're thinking about the hospitality and what brings people in so that they do feel included and feel like giving is a natural next step. 
Um, one of my favorite books, I know I've referenced it before, but Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara is um, the story of his hospitality philosophy of his restaurant. And I just like in that it was so it was there were so many great reminders about how really little things can make a big difference. But universal universally, the themes throughout were simply meeting people where they were at, listening to people, Mm -hmm. supporting what people's basic needs were. Right. Like if our basic needs aren't met, we're not able to participate because we're like all we can think of is I am hungry. We riot. Right. We riot if, <laughs> right. if I if we don't have dinner. So yeah. the like guest experience picture to me is everything from like how they're greeted when they arrive to the food to the look of the room or the vibe Absolutely. of the room. I walked into this big gala once where Kristen and I were a guest and they had like the work lights on and no music playing. And I, I paused and was like, are we not supposed to be here? Are we in the right spot? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Are we early was my immediate yeah. thought. It, we got the yeah. time wrong. Yeah, that's what I thought too. And yet that was just their, that was the their vibe. vibe they had. Yeah. You know, that's, that's so interesting. And one of the things that we are very intentional about is 30 minutes before the start time of an event. Yes. That's our go time because you're going to have early arrivals. Yep. yep. And it's really important to me that when those early arrivals inevitably show up, we're ready to go. And they're not walking into the planners running around like crazy and things feeling unwelcoming the second they walk in the door. When you have that environment ready to go, it just creates this um, completely different tone when somebody walks in the door. A lot of fundraising events, you may not know a ton of people there. You might be coming as a guest of your, you know, your company that you work for. You might have been invited by a board member. And, you know, I think just remembering what that's like, because we've all been in those shoes (laughs) um, and, and doing what we can to welcome them with just warmth and uh, that hospitality piece really makes a difference. Great. Well, so in the sort of, shift of the fundraising landscape as we've been sort of seeing a lot more technology evolve. I mean, I think the QR code is having its moment right now. (laughs) What are some of the trends that you're seeing that impact guest experience? Absolutely. One trend that we've seen across the board, regardless really of region or, uh, you know, mission of an organization, uh, across the board, we are seeing a complete diversion from guest interest in transactional giving. So I think when it comes to things like a raffle, silent auction, wine poll, choose one. Um, When you think about the time that folks attend a welcome reception before they join a program and dinner for an event, some of them are coming from work. Some of them are coming from getting their kids settled with a babysitter. You don't have hours where they can talk to people, grab food, grab a drink, do five different fundraising activation activities. Um, So distill it down and really center, like when you put yourself in those guest shoes, what would I want to do if I have Mm -hmm. 45 minutes at a reception? Um, And when you think about it that way, I think the stripping down of some of the abundant fundraising activities that (laughs) kind of happened uh, pre-COVID, I want to say, um, (laughs) It's also just such a staff time suck from yeah. a nonprofit, for a nonprofit staff to take on um, with very little financial return in the big scheme of things. Right. So I think that that's a trend that we've seen across the board. And I would really encourage you to look at what are the most popular um, activity that you can still have an activation point, maybe a lower tier for somebody to support. Um, that is all great, but you don't need five of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another trend that I think has been really cool to see is, you know, photo booths, I think, have been a popular incorporation. But uh, sort of an evolution of that that we've seen that I've really loved to incorporate into events that we've done is creating like a statement decor piece. So this Mm -hmm. could be in your reception area. This could be your part of your stage backdrop. um, But creating kind of like a big wow statement piece. Maybe it's a balloon arch. Maybe it's a floor, big floral installation. Um, Those can serve the purpose of being an awesome photo backdrop, have your logo incorporated in it Mm -hmm. or the event branding incorporated into it for some 
um, branding awareness, but it's an opportunity for guests to take pictures, share on social media um, in just a totally different way. Plus it creates like a very stunning um, high impact, you know, piece of decor that serving dual purposes. So I think investing in that becomes reasonable and it's often you can do it for just as much, if not less than what a traditional photo booth costs. Yeah. Yep. So yep. that's been a really cool trend. Um, and then another one that I just have to mention is we've had some organizations being willing to um, try new things with us. Uh -huh. And <laughs> we did our first event last fall with a fully vegetarian menu. Amazing. And so I think oh, um, being open to trying new things, even if they feel like an abrupt diversion from what you've done in the past, can bring about really exciting change and refreshing yeah. your event with a different tone. Um, the organization that did this was really nervous about how guests yep. would take it. And they ultimately decided they would not share this detail with guests prior. So <laughs> they knew the food would be good. They knew that they were accommodating a variety of dietary restrictions. Um, and it was a risk, but people loved it. Awesome. And not only did they love it, but like for the organization, it was more cost effective yeah. and more environmentally sustainable. So I think that that is a trend that I absolutely hope to see continue and um, can't wait to do more of that. I know that not everyone's social media feed is like mine because I follow like every nonprofit, <laughs> every auctioneer, every gala, every vendor that works in yep. the fundraising space. But my social media is filled with exactly what you just talked about. It's the statement piece. That's where everyone mm -hmm. like takes their photo and then shares that out. Mm -hmm. So whether it's something that's on the stage or something that's intentionally a photo booth, photo booth is the trend mm -hmm. like of the day. Like everyone wants that chance to like have the red carpet moment, the sort of celebrity walk down the red carpet. And then the other element that I see is always the fun element. It's mm -hmm. always the like people interacting with each mm -hmm. other, whether totally. it's the reception or the dancing or the like the community of who you're running into. It's never the auction. It's never exactly. wine pulls. And like that is not where people's interest is. I got a buttery is. Chardonnay. What did you get from right. the wine pull? Like, you know. <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And there's nothing, there's nothing worse than helping, you know, an organization load all that in at the beginning of the day yeah. and, and load, load it out. It is left at the end of the night. And, uh, it just feels like that work and that time and attention focusing elsewhere could have tenfold the impact. Yep. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting to me, too, about sort of the decor centerpiece in the same way that we suggest organizations put their logo on the hotel podium yeah. <laughs> with uh -huh. a sign versus the hotel sign, this becomes a way to do that. So you as the organization are getting your event design yeah. name branding exactly. out in terms of that engagement, but it's also telling a story. I always love it when I see that same thing over multiple users oh, yeah. on my social media and I'm like, hey, why didn't I get involved mm -hmm. to that party? Like, it becomes like a whole thing that I think- 100%. It, none of it's throwaway. And just like you were talking about that being an investment, you, we're not talking about your whole room. Your whole room should not have vomited birds of paradise. <laughs> but when you really get specific and make yes. it your brand colors, your engagement, like- I've also seen a lot of unsuspecting organizations use it as a fun piece that I wouldn't necessarily think of them as fun. And that's <laughs> also part of the story. I'm thinking specifically, you know, child abuse, DV, like all yeah. of that. Like a lot of intentionality is in going into these gatherings to be about celebrating survivors, yeah, celebrating strength, strength yeah. celebrating stories of resilience. And that becomes another way to sort of bring that thread through. So I think it's great. It's so true. I, I think, you know, starting with those trends and whatnot as a base is yeah. kind of bare minimum. When you start to incorporate your mission on display through yeah. those kinds yeah. of pieces, you're just creating those moments for emotional connection to really hit home for your guests, what your organization does. We did an event a few weeks ago with um, a furniture bank uh -huh. and 
you know, their work centers around providing furniture for folks that may otherwise not have the means to furnish an apartment. And they're all about making a house a home with those Mm -hmm. necessary pieces that many of us take for granted. And we had planned along the way to have a, we were calling it a selfie station. So I said, great, let me know what you need and we can use what the venue has, bring costs down. So we realized, okay, we'll put some pipe and drape up. We can use a couch from the venue and then maybe a coffee table and a lamp. Um, This group understood the assignment. (laughs) They loaded up a bunch of furniture, a bunch of really like unique kitschy pieces from the warehouse. Amazing. And created this. It was unbelievable. I mean, I'm, I was early in the setup. I was looking at this like sad couch and the sad coffee table. And I was like, Ugh. when they brought those pieces in and really created um, this warm, totally eclectic set with a ton of personality that just encompassed their mission yeah, in yeah. one visual. It was amazing. That's and awesome. it was so cool to see the guests interacting with it, asking about some of the weird pieces that were incorporated <laughs> into it. It was just, it became like a conversation piece and a way to enhance the connection amongst guests that was already happening. Um, So I think, you know, take some of those starting trends and look for opportunities where you can infuse your own unique mission. And that's just a way to really... hit that home for your guests I in, a, in a very cool more. way. The like it. mission centered is always where we get those sparks that I'm yep. like, oh, this is so good. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. I feel like we could talk ideas yep. forever, yep, but true. we're going to take a short promotional break and then we're going to have more fun when we come back. So we'll be right back. Loving the fundraising elevator, but wondering how you can talk to Sam and Kristen? Well, now's your chance to do it. Book one-on-one consulting time with Swain Strategies experts, Sam, Kristen, and Mary, and get all your event questions answered. Our team has you covered on strategic planning, fundraising strategy, storytelling, data tools, and registration support. Get the tools and the help you need to make the most impact at your fundraising event. Book at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. Welcome back to the Fundraising Elevator. We are here with event producer Tanya Mickelson, an ex- who is an expert in tying mission to your guest experience yes. at your event. I've had big wow moments walking into some of your yes. events, Tanya, <laughs> as has Sam. Talk to us about some of the areas that you focus on for impact. Totally. Well, probably one of my very favorite things about an event is that moment when either clients or guests walk into the room and they're like, wow. Or, Uh oh my gosh, I, that is, that's what I'm looking for. You know, there's nothing that makes my heart happier. (laughs) Um, but there's, and there's a lot of opportunities in, in how you can create that wow moment. But for me, I feel like stage design at a practical level is a really great area to focus resources and creativity around making that a show stopping piece. Um, it's obviously serving as the backdrop for your entire program. So when your guests are seated and focused on what's happening on stage, that's the backdrop. Um, so it's an investment well spent, I think. Um, and again, thinking from just a, a social media perspective or being able to showcase to your sponsors post-event what you've accomplished, mm-hmm. having some of those really strong photos with your speaker at a podium. Mm-hmm. Yes, Kristen. Very critical to have your organization um, branded on that that signage and not the hotel venue that you're in. But I think that it just creates this amazing um, way to, you know, take a photo and have that really be what Mm -hmm. stands out from social media or, you know, post event sharing out. Um, and a way to increase excitement for the next year. Include photos from your event in sponsorship packets or in newsletters when you're promoting your next year's event. But that stage design can really ha- be an awesome way to do that. Um, I also think, like just as an example, a lot of organizations find themselves in banquet hotel type yeah. Um, yeah. venues, which yeah. very cost effective. So, um, and oftentimes they do have all of the infrastructure to pull off a great event. So a great place to start. Um, But it also creates a format where usually there is a big ballroom or some separate space where the dinner and program is happening. So one of the things that I really love to do is 
when the program and the dinner is happening in one room, oftentimes you have a foyer space or something outside of that where you're having a welcome reception, um, kind of a pre-function gathering of some sort. Um, in that pre-function gathering, you don't need to do all of the things. Some uplighting, some small arrangements on tables that incorporate some of your event branding colors are great. And it kind of gives a little taste, brands the room to the specific event or organization that's hosting it. Um, and I think it can, can kind of start leaving a little breadcrumbs for what guests can expect when they walk into that ballroom. Mm. And when we have a venue that has that kind of format, my favorite thing to do is when they walk in the ballroom, that's where I want the wow factor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think that looking at where you can focus your resources, you don't have to do everything everywhere across the board. Um, focus that to where your guests are going to be spending the most time, which is in the ballroom at the, you know, during the, the dinner program. while they're watching yeah. the program. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to look at is there a stage installation that we can put in with maybe some pillars that can create depth and can be lit um maybe your logo is projected on there uh having complementary table arrangements that just kind of when you look across that whole room can create a big wow factor for pretty little investment um but that's you know that's what i'm going for when yeah. guests walk into a space is um where can you create those moments to have that really big impact that's not breaking your budget at the same time? Well, and the other thing I'm hearing is cohesion. Yeah. We've been to, we've all been to those events where you like, there's one thing happening maybe in the pre-funk and then yeah. there's another thing happening, right? You feel, it feels disconnected that the more energy I as a guest spend on trying to understand right. what is happening or where I am, or how to do that. The less, the less the of my right. energy yeah. you're going to get. Absolutely. You, you had two events that come to mind for me. I mean, you've had some incredible like stage looks at your events, but two events in particular where you used um, audio visual to create mm. the stage look, and you had a big floating screen in the middle behind the stage that had brand imagery on it. One of the events in particular. The event was themed Beautiful Night, and the logo and the look of the event was sort of like a cloudy night sky with little stars in it. And you had a floating screen that was offset from the drape. And the drape had kind of like a midnight blue saturation that you did with uplighting. And then you had this gorgeous, like, floating screen that had the clouds and the stars with very beautiful little gentle motion happening. And it was very subtle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would really have to be, like, looking at it to see it. But it added a depth of texture and mm. layer and brand identity mm -hmm. that was a giant wow moment. And it wasn't. It wasn't like you didn't have to build a set, right? Like it yeah, wasn't like we, a Broadway absolutely. show. And it was 100%. beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it was stunning yeah. and um, simple but elegant. And it was separate. Like that screen and what was on that screen was separate from what your content screens were. It was a decor screen. Mm -hmm. But in that decor, you could change yep. the look. And you had totally. a couple of little shifts that through the night – just brought another like wow moment with very little cost. So absolutely. I think sometimes we think it can be really expensive yeah. to create yeah. these looks. What are some of your tips for that like low cost? Where does a little thing make a big impact? Yeah, uh, you already alluded to it, but I think working with your audiovisual production company that is supporting your event, whether that is you know, somebody that you choose to bring into a venue, or maybe it's the venues in house. Um, for that event that you mentioned, uh, we worked with their in house AV team, all of those pieces we already had, oh, it was a screen yeah. that came with the rental. Um, we used uh, branding assets from the that their graphic designer had already provided. And it was just a co fun collaboration that I had with the AV team at that venue to say, I have these folder of images. And I know we have this screen. What can we do to really yeah. create a memorable backdrop? And th for this event specifically, it was for an organization that hosts their event at the same venue year over year. And so I think one of the challenges when you do that is how do you make that experience yeah, feel yep. and look different in a way that isn't just a re copy paste um, 
from year to year. And so start with what you have um, available, you know, from your venue, Mm -hmm. from your AV partners. But I think in general, one of my biggest tips to folks looking for a big impact with low, um, a low budget or price tag would be lighting design. Yeah. Um, Have to shout out. Andy Everson at the AV department. <laughs> yeah. He's like one of the best it's in um, our true. area for sure. But when we have him on an event, I literally have no uh, concerns that yeah. it's not going to bring a huge wow factor. Um, he just has that eye for being able to pick out the branding colors um, from an organization's event graphics that are really going to like make the room pop and tie everything together. I cannot tell you how many event sites I've been on that I'm like watching the setup happen. I'm like, this is not looking how I envisioned. Oh my gosh. And then, and then the Andy shows up with the <laughs> sexy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then the lighting goes on and I'm like, oh, there it is. There it is. Uh, the sexy lighting so, changes uh, everything. It creates exactly. the vibe. It Man. helps like create how people feel. Exactly. Uh, we just did an event in a warehouse of all things in a food bank warehouse. One of my biggest challenges so picture Costco, picture those fluorescent uh-huh. lights. That was kind of what it looked like um, when it's in warehouse mode. But mm-hmm. our challenge was how do we create uh, an event venue out of this space? And so the partnership uh, with our production AV company in that instance was the only way that we were able to achieve yeah. that. Um, by the time we setup was done, we literally had every overhead warehouse light off and had created this custom look that really transformed the space. And it was lighting. All it was was yeah. lighting. Yeah. Um, and so, again, there's a scale. You can go big. But for kind of a middle ground or lower price point, you can still have an incredible impact with the look and the feel of your event. I always look to my linen choices, too, because... Um, mm-hmm. The linen tables fill so much of the room exactly. and can create its own sort of color palette. Um, we had an event recently where it was in a hotel ballroom. The hotel came with the tables, the chairs, and then like a palette of four colors. And normally you see like you have white or black. If mm-hmm. if if there is a linen offered as a free offering, you usually just have a very limited palette. And this particular venue had ivory and navy blue because it went with their sort of aesthetic of the hotel and so we designed the logo of the Mm. event to pull through those colors so that we could use the free linen to brand the event in the same way that you know i would pay for linen costs here i could use that free resource yep absolutely that's brilliant let's talk about guest arrival Mm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. um which is sort of how we get to wow factor right. for a guest, right? But but I show up, and I'm I'm your worst <laughs> customer because I show up <laughs> ready to go to soft pants, right? Uh-huh. So everything <laughs> either becomes a barrier to me or an an open hand to me. And in Paul Zach's book Immersion, um, Paul talks about one of the key steps to satisfaction and engagement being staging. Is it? easy and clear for me to understand mm-hmm. how to participate and right. what's happening around me. What are some recommendations you have for staging and kicking off guest arrival right? Yeah. There's nothing worse than not knowing what to do when you arrive <laughs> yes. at an event and speaking from personal experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I think, again, really put yourself in a guest shoes yeah. and how you would feel walking into a space and this process starts much earlier than the start time of the event. Yes. So like a couple things that happen before the day of the event that really impact this piece are your data, your guest data. Um, the more solid your data is, the less hiccups you're going to have at registration with um, sponsor guest names or board members that might be bringing a table of their friends. Yeah. Uh, nobody loves the feeling of checking in somewhere and, oh, I'm not on the list or, oh, my name is wrong or (laughs) that kind of thing. Yes. So data, super important. That's one of those pre-event pieces you can hone in on to mitigate that. Yep. I would say second pre-event piece that you can focus on that can impact this is your communication with your guests. Mm. So um, it takes many times, I think, (laughs) as you have probably talked about on this podcast, um, it takes a few touches to really 
ensure that the information that you want your guests to be coming into the event with is seen and retained. And so I think making sure you have a series of communications going out, um, most importantly, your um, guest attendee confirmation, which is kind of that our event's coming up. Here's everything you need to know. Giving them the communication in advance and sort of giving them that sneak peek of like, this is how the evening is going to go. This is what you can expect. This is what time dinner is. This is what's going to be available in our reception. What to wear, where to park. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. Those basic things uh, that can just create a smooth um, entry for guests to your event can be done in advance and sets you up for a lot of success right off the bat. And then when they arrive, I mean, I think one of the things that we're really intentional about is how we incorporate volunteer support into the event. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, especially when we are at a big venue, we might have anywhere from six to eight greeters, Mm -hmm. which seems like a lot. But if you have multiple points of entry or multiple floors that you're trying to navigate folks walking in a main entrance up to a third floor ballroom, having volunteers placed kind of strategically throughout the path that they would take to greet them with a warm, friendly face, head upstairs, check into registration on your Mm -hmm. right. It just takes away the guesswork from your guests and I think makes them feel hosted and welcomed and like they should be there. Yep. Um, So I think that those are pieces that can help with that staging aspect. Um, And then once your guests get to registration, make sure that you're training your volunteers to give them a brief series of instructions on what to do next. Here's your bid card. Our reception is happening right now. Our (laughs) bar is over there. We have these food options um, and enjoy the music by so-and-so. Our program will begin at this time. Those kind of key instructions can just, again, take away the guesswork and let folks know how they can participate in this space that they just plopped into. Uh, So I think that those can all set you up for success, but you never want your guests having to guess or wonder what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's Um, exactly right. It puts them in a different part of their brain, actually, literally. Frustration. Well, from a neuroscience point of view, I want them to continue to connect emotionally, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm I'm Mm -hmm. building an arc. To your point, that starts before I show up at registration. I'm already on it. Yeah. And you yeah. can either send that arc downward, right, <laughs> really quickly, <laughs> or you can take my hand and start leading me up to your peak of engagement of fundraising. And so just continuing to make it that I stay in that calm space where yeah. my Maslow's mm-hmm. hierarchy of needs is being taken care of, where I'm not second guessing the organization and why they made these choices puts us all on the same page and all on the same team working toward the same thing. I think totally. it's great. Yeah, I think one. Yeah, of the, and then, the other thing that I guess I want to also say is that anyone that does events knows that there are so many aspects that are not in your control, nope. right? Like yeah. things happen at events <laughs> all the time that we're like, this is not going to plan. Or, <laughs> uh, you know, as an example, I feel like a big line at registration. Mm-hmm. You didn't plan for that. You certainly don't want it, but it can happen, and it's happened to me, and it's happened to probably most planners that have done these events, you know, those situations that you didn't expect that all of a sudden it's happening and you need to kind of come up with a plan in the moment. And that's where I think, you know, going back to choosing a catering partner that can be collaborative and responsive with you in those moments, um, instead of running and panicking of, oh my God, there's a line at registration, go to your caterer. Can we try pass some beverages? Can you pull a few of your leadership staff to start engaging those folks in conversation in a way that can offset some of the discomfort or negative uh, feelings that can come from having to sit in a line for 10 minutes. Um, When you remember that hospitality piece and really just like keep yourself in the shoes of your guests, those are things that would make me feel like I wouldn't remember waiting in line for 10 minutes. I would remember, oh, this um, program director came up and asked me how my night was going and talked to me for five minutes. Like that, those touches matter. And so, um, it's not to say that things won't happen that are out of your control and that you might see some of those guest pieces or experience start slipping away, but, you know, stay calm. You have a room full of partners that have all came together to make this event happen and, you know, figure out what you can do to kind of offset that. Um, 
but it's not lost on me that there's many times that, you know, things happen that we don't plan for. But I think just centering that hospitality and always leading with kindness in that way um, can really change the tone, even if there are some unplanned hurdles. Absolutely. Some of those big venues that are, you know, multi-event venues, like a convention center, a hotel with multiple ballrooms, a casino, um, you know, sometimes people have to walk so far to get into the place where <laughs> mm-hmm. your party is. Yeah. And I had an event where our registration was going sideways and I was like, what is happening? Like we had so many people at registration with questions of how come I'm not on the list? And we were trying to troubleshoot all of them. And we learned quickly that there was another event happening mm. and the in another ballroom upstairs from us. And People liked the look of our party and were coming and checking it out. And when we finally figured out that there was like a ball happening upstairs and the gala Mm -hmm. we were doing was downstairs, people, we were redirecting people and people said, oh, but this one looks fun. (laughs) And so we had like people who wanted to stay and Mm -hmm. the like opportunity for I'm sure those guests probably went to that event frustrated, probably a little embarrassed that they had gone to the wrong event, maybe wanting to stay at the other event that the opportunity to just simply make sure people get to where they're going easily is just such an easy way to make sure your guest arrives ready to be a part of the event. Wayfinding people. Wayfinding. Well, programs have been an interesting thing that have been shifting too. And I've seen that just like – the past couple of years, there's been a big shift of how much time people are willing to give mm-hmm. events. Yep. Yep. Yeah, It was funny. We had an event recently where like 8.30, all of a sudden people just cleared out. And I had mm-hmm. someone, a guest say to me, oh, yeah, well, it's 8.30. Like that. Like that's the new normal. That's the new normal. <laughs> yeah. So what are some things that you're seeing? Like where do guests engage most right now? Or what are some of the like flow changes that you've been yeah. seeing? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that one of the things that we no longer can count on are the six hour investment for somebody yeah, right. to come <laughs> at five o'clock right after work or on a Saturday when it's nice out and stay till 10, 11 yep. o'clock. Like yep. that just has not happened. I yeah. think in the last year of events that I've been doing. Um, so I feel like you kind of have to look at the welcome reception and the after party or post program socializing as you can't guarantee that all your guests are going to be physically there and engaging the way that you want. So I think that setting yourself up for that expectation and just thinking of your welcome reception as this open house kind of concept, you're not going to have, not everyone is going to show up right on the dot of your start time. We've consistently seen guests um, come in, 30 minutes into a welcome reception, 45 minutes into a welcome reception. Sometimes they're blowing in, you know, right just As to get the to program. the program. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think when you think of it that way, that's where not doing as many transactional giving pieces yeah. starts to make sense. Um, that's where making your, sure you have accessible bars and food um, in a way that will still allow those late arrivals to still grab a drink, to still grab some food. Like we we don't want them to not feel welcome just because they may not have been able to get to the event right at the start time. Yeah. Um, And I think similar for an after party, we've had a lot of organizations put a lot of investment and planning into this like post program (laughs) festivity of whatever that may look like. You have to really rein in expectations about how many people are going to stay and engage in the way that you want. Um, We've had so many events uh, recently where, a common uh, post-program activity is, you know, DJ dancing is kind of the goal. But many times people are not engaging in that. They just want to stay at their tables and connect with each other. And I think one of the things that I'm really challenging uh, folks to think about is instead of creating this party with this very specific, like you expect people dancing on a dance floor, just look at your job is to create an environment that is conducive to socializing. Um, You can still have a DJ, you can still have a live band, but make sure that where you're placing that piece still allows for connection and socializing. If folks do just want to have a cup of coffee and chat before they head out. Yeah. Um, 
So I think just not putting so much stake in expecting people to engage and participate 100% in those pre and post um, bookends to your dinner and program uh, is just like a trend that we've seen across the board. Just reevaluate what that could look like and um, pare it down. You you really are just creating a enjoyable atmosphere for folks to connect. Yeah. Um, as a human being, I love that. As a human that. being. <laughs> yeah. Like that's just, that's, that's actually heartening to me that the volume is turning down on. Yeah. Party. Yeah. yeah. And, and what all of that can entail for an organization. And it's really Absolutely. about creating a space for your community to come together and yeah. connect. And that's totally. actually how you take your mission and the event out of the room. Exactly. Yeah, I've seen the the idea of the after party has been a dying thing, yes. and yet I do see the desire for people once they've sat through a program together to still have connection. Yes. yes. So totally. some after time, yep. but not putting mm-hmm. all your eggs in the basket of like, and now the party begins, and you have like nine people that stick around. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> well, we're gonna take a short promotional break, and then when we come back, we're gonna get in the fundraising elevator with Tanya. We'll Love be it. right back. The Fundraising Elevator is recorded at the AV Department in Portland, Oregon. For years, they've been our trusted partner, delivering exceptional audiovisual production and videography for nonprofits. In 2020, they transformed into a dynamic live streaming studio, producing more than 900 virtual and hybrid events. Now, we embark on an exciting journey together to bring you this podcast. Seeking the best in live events, video production, and live streaming? We proudly recommend our friends at the AV department. Link in the episode description. Welcome back to the Fundraising Elevator. We are here with Tanya Mickelson, event planner extraordinaire, (laughs) specializing in guest experience. So for a first-time planner, or probably more often, For the development professional who has to plan an event once a year. We do this all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Right? This they have to do it once a year and it's like sort of re-remembering all those pieces. So they're working hard to secure their guests and sponsors, get all that correct data into the database, get their vendors contracted. What is your best recommendation about where they should spend their money? to help mm-hmm. ensure a great guest experience. We can do all yeah. that stuff, right? But how do I or their time? Or their well, their time as <laughs> yeah. well. I think it's that mm-hmm. it's that that crossroads of those pieces. Where totally. should I do that for impact? Yeah, it's a great question. Um I think it goes back to one of the first things that I mentioned which is to me allocating resources for those key partners, key vendor partners, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, can alleviate and really transform the way specifically like a development professional needs to tap into the planning process. When you have professionals that are doing what their area of expertise is, like decor, like catering, like AV production, you don't have to micromanage those details in the way that you would if you didn't have key partners like that as a part of the process. And it leaves you to focus on the relationships because that to me is like the biggest thing that a development staff or team can do to ensure the success of the event. The relationship aspect is key in getting people to your event. It's key in getting those sponsorships, those pre-committed gifts. Um, And when you have professionals that you know are dialed in on the details of the logistics and how to make that event actually come together, you don't have to feel the pressure of trying to be an expert in all of these areas. It's not possible. I mean, even as a planner, there are absolutely times that I've said, I am not a florist. (laughs) I cannot arrange your centerpieces, you know? So I think knowing when to bring in partners that can support those kinds of pieces where you don't have to be the expert is really the biggest piece of advice I could give to first-time planners. You are not responsible for being an expert in all of the things that come with planning an event. Um, And the other thing I would say for first-time planners is the best thing that you can do to get a grasp on what is going to resonate with your donors from an event perspective is attending or volunteering at other events. Oh, Go yes. to That's a bunch. Great. That is the best way to really conceptualize the guest experience. And I think it's just, it's so hard. I cannot tell you how many organizations we've worked with brand new staff 
um, that have not been in their positions very long, have not done an event with that organization or ever. And Mm -hmm. it's no wonder they don't feel like they have a handle on what that process looks like. Um, But when you attend other events, you see what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to do that at ours or that would never work for our our donor base. Um, But you're going to see a lot of really great examples or even inspiration for examples that you can take and make your own at your at your event. So I think that's the the best advice that I could give a new planner is invest in your key partners. You are not responsible for being an expert (laughs) in food (laughs) service or decor. Mm -hmm. Um, Focus on the relationships and immerse yourself in a lot of different kinds of events so that you can kind of take bits and pieces that resonate with you and apply those for your event. Um, Because chances are, if they're resonating and creating an emotional connection for you, they will with your donors as well. I think we undervalue experiential learning in that way, especially in the event space. And events are all about theatricality, Yeah, right? They're all about working on every, you brought up earlier the idea of the senses. What's this going to make me feel? What am Mm -hmm. I hearing? What is all of that? And all of that visceral stuff operating on a guest and an experience is something you can't intellectualize. Yeah, Like on paper, we can talk in just... I, as a first time planner, I'm not I'm not an expert in lighting yeah. grids. I don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. But Andy's an expert. But in Andy's lighting. an expert. <laughs> and can Andy tell me or show me pictures or where can I go yeah. see that? And when you feel it, when you feel those lights change, when you feel the music come up, when you see that strong stage display where maybe the rest of the room's held together with band-aids, but that <laughs> stage, because we're sitting in the dark anyway, right? But that <laughs> stage looks beautiful and strong and yeah. every speaker up there is able to be heard. Yeah. Because you have really good audio. Like there are just things that you start to experience. And then when you don't, you go, wait, what What was that train wreck? What happened? And then you can start to learn. So I I love that. Everybody needs event volunteers. Shout out to Dwayne, our audio technician, the yes, power of Dwayne. good audio. We love you, Dwayne. <laughs> if I do think sometimes people underestimate the simple things. I mean, you mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like if you can't hear, why have a program? Yep. If you yeah. can't get to the food, why have food? You yeah. know, it's sort yeah. of those basic needs yep. being met is a consideration of just creating that yeah. experience. No, I love it. I think I think that suggestion is brilliant, Tanya. Thanks. Well, Tanya, you said that um, there is an opportunity to learn by going and volunteering at other events. And I think mm-hmm. every nonprofit needs volunteers. Every nonprofit mm-hmm. is looking for volunteers to support their event. And I know you have been to so many mm-hmm. nonprofit events, both that you've planned and that you've staffed for for me or that you've gone and you've supported as a volunteer. So hop in the fundraising elevator with me for a second and head up to the penthouse where the party is and tell me about an event that you went to. Maybe it wasn't a maybe it wasn't a fundraising event, but an event you went to that was memorable. And most importantly, what made it memorable? What was the thing that stood out to you as a guest? Uh, This is my favorite part of the podcast. I'm so (laughs) excited to be asked this question. I always love hearing uh, the wide range of answers that you get. Um, But uh, one event really stands out in my mind. And we had the opportunity to to work with an organization last year that uh, they were a animal welfare organization and it was an anniversary year for them. So they had started in 19 in the 1990s and they wanted to like embrace that as a theme. Amazing. And so it was by far the most fun I've had planning um, an event, <laughs> but there were moments along the way that I was like, uh-huh. I Is hope this, this goes work? over in the way that we want. <laughs> yeah. um, but we ended up with this like Lisa Frank meets 90s workout gear, color scheme, just extravaganza and it was so fun (laughs) everything from like the linen colors to the lighting that we had in the room the centerpieces were all 90s uh bright colors like neon glow exactly exactly um so it was so cool to see the reactions to from guests when they walked Mm -hmm. into the space and the other really unique aspect to this event is that the team that we were working with was just not afraid to have fun. So the entire planning process was fun. They did not get caught up in the stress of like, oh, what is this video going to be? Or what are our centerpieces going to be? They just really were like, go for it. And it just felt like a <laughs> playground. Um, but one of the things that this team did that really just 
picked it out of the park in a way that was so unique and so special was that they had a wonderful event program, right? It had all the pieces. It had the storytelling. It had the organization video. So everyone knew what they did. It had the really touching, emotional, like single story of impact. We had a moment of giving and a paddle raise and all of that. Um, executive director speeches, all of those pieces, right? But then at the end of the event, the kind of close to it was a rendition of a compilation of like hits from the 90s <laughs> where the executive director and the <laughs> development director created lyrics that spoke all about the mission and how the donors were and guests there that night were making it possible. People were on their feet, dancing along, laughing, crying. Like it was just something to behold. Um, and if that wasn't good enough, instead of doing like the typical DJ dance after party, they wanted to do karaoke. So oh my we God. literally turned it into a karaoke party. And it was so cool because not only was the organization staff up there, guests were up there. I mean, sponsor guests, major donors. That's they were amazing. <laughs> But even like service staff, like God is ah, so good. service staff is having a fun at an event like that. I just think that like every single person, whether they were on the clock or attending as a guest of somebody, left that event genuinely have having having had an amazing time. Like it was unique. It was so them. But everyone still understood what their mission was and knew exactly what they were there mm, for. That's but the important was part. Way that was so unique and that's just, true. yeah, um, it was really cool to be a part of that energy in the room because you can, it's something special when you hit those notes. Like you can feel it in the room yep. and you can look out and see how people are responding, and it's just magic. That's so, awesome. um, yeah, when you confuse that out. fun. Uh -huh. With mission and yes. theme together, though that is like a magic. Yeah. yeah. All right, we're gonna head down to the basement where the tools are. What is a yeah. tool you think that every fundraiser needs in their toolbox? Uh, critical. I think we have been talking a lot about things that are not free, right? Mm. So I think that the number one tool, from like a tactical level, is creating a solid event budget. Yeah. Um, yep. And not only that, but you need to create that budget having a very solid understanding of what your goals are. Is your goal to raise X amount of money? Is your goal to bring X amount of new supporters into the space? Yes. Your goals don't have to be financially driven, but whatever those goals are, you should be able to create a budget, even if it doesn't have a lot of revenue, if that's not the purpose. But having those guardrails to work within that brings your entire, yeah. you know, organization on board, your board understanding and being transparent with, if we want to host an event that creates a movement, we need to invest. And yeah. so I think just getting that business part of it out of the way gives planners guardrails to know this is my budget for a venue. This yeah. is my budget for catering. Um, you can really start to see what's possible uh, when you have that as a starting tactical point. I couldn't agree more. I love yeah. what you just said about if we're going to build a movement. Yeah, you have, to, have, we, you have to know are, what your guardrails are. Well, but also what are we going to invest? Yeah. And, and I mm -hmm. think those go hand in hand. Tanya, I adore talking event shop with you. Thank you for being here today. But what's more My than pleasure. that? It was so fun. Thanks for all you do in the world. Yeah. You're a good Sprite out there. We're glad to know you. We're so glad to have you on and share your expertise with all of our listeners. Thanks for joining Thank us today. Too. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. 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 The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV department. The program is produced by April Clark and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson and Heidi Christensen. Video production by Chris Peterson, Whitney Gomes, and Nathan Bouquet. Video editing by Steve Osborne. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group. And support from Sophia Keller, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett. At Elevate, we believe in bringing people together. 
our online learning platform for fundraising events has webinars, workshops, downloadable tools, and more designed to save you time and stress when planning your next event. We're getting nonprofit, development, and event planning professionals the tools and ideas they need to create events that inspire donors and raise more money. So join us at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes.